Well, you did it, big guy. You made it four years. I can confidently say there hasn't been another Mac I've held on to and used daily for this long, and it serves right because this is still one of the most expensive Apple products I've ever purchased, but it was well worth the money. It carried the Telosive network for years, and I have so much nice things to say about it, but it's still gonna be kind of bittersweet. Let's begin. So yeah, it was the day after Christmas of 2017 where I was super duper pumped because the iMac Pro, the most expensive Apple product I had ever bought, was out for delivery and I had saved all 2017 for this Mac ever since they unveiled it at Quadruple UDC where I was still in the attic. My mind was blown because of course I was still on the huge space gray train which I've made somewhat of a return to, it's kind of graphite now, but I loved the fact that Apple finally brought a matte black finish to the iMac Pro and brought some Pro I.O., which to this day I don't think can be topped. Name me another Mac out there that got four Thunderbolt 3 ports and four USB-A ports for all of those legacy cables still out there, plus the Ethernet headphone jack and the SD card slot reader. Even the $50,000 Mac Pro, which came out a few years later, didn't rock an SD card slot when this puppy did. Not to mention I think this was one of the best overall packages in history you could buy from Apple or from anyone when it comes to an all-in-one desktop design. Obviously, we can get very creative with different PC builds and how that compares to the Mac Pro or the Mac Mini in terms of performance, Windows optimization versus Mac OS optimization, that's a deep rabbit hole, but I think the iMac Pro was unparalleled when it came to the best overall package you got within a single device. This is not a tower. You're getting an amazing 5K display panel with the first ever in a Mac 1080p webcam that had never been done before this machine. Not to mention they beefed up the base in this model compared to the typical 27-inch iMacs, and thank God it was the first iMac iMac ever to go all in on SSD. This was the first iMac they unveiled where you could only get it with an SSD option and it started with one terabyte. To this day, I can't think of another Mac out there where by default, the cheapest option shipped with a one terabyte SSD. Even nowadays, all Macs start with 512 gigs usually or 256 for some of them. This desktop lived up to that pro naming by saying, no, by default, even if you're getting the cheapest possible iMac Pro, you're getting getting one terabyte of SSD, and yes, you're getting 32 gigs of RAM. There's no exceptions, you cannot go lower than that, and the improved speaker quality was incredibly noticeable, and after using several of my friend's 27-inch iMacs that were 5K, I noticed that despite the display being very, very high resolution, much higher than anything else available at the time, the hardware inside those 27-inch iMacs really wasn't built to display much at the 5K resolution. That's why the iMac Pro was so awesome in my view because the Radeon Pro graphics cards in this thing could actually sustain a lot of things at 5k. It could actually play videos back at a full 5k 60 frames a second sometimes, depending on the codec of the file of course, but even when I did some light gaming on the iMac Pro, there was a few lighter games that could actually output at the full 5k resolution, which was awesome and definitely not achievable on the regular old-fashioned 27 inch iMacs, which basically just had one fan trying to cool down every everything, whereas the iMac Pro was when Apple finally went full force and had two giant fans on the inside that were able to cool the entire iMac and yet keep it incredibly quiet the majority of the time, which was incredibly useful whenever you wanted to do FaceTime or live streaming off of this Mac, which I did a ton of, which was also a pleasant surprise. The onboard microphones with the iMac Pro were actually really decent, better than any other Mac I had reviewed, which means that even when I plugged in, you know, my Blackmagic camera or external microphones to use with this thing. Sometimes, if I didn't have access or have time to set up all that stuff, I could just stream directly off of the onboard mic and webcam, and most people were like, this sounds pretty great. There were never that many complaints when it came to the actual webcam performance and microphone quality. The only one that came up that thankfully Apple has since fixed with their own Apple Silicon is the aperture on the iMac Pro. When I had lighting change or my head would move around while streaming and stuff, it was quite noticeable when it was changing exposures and that little jitter was definitely bothering some people, not all, but it's a pretty small detail to have when we're talking about Mac webcam quality. When, keep in mind, they announced in 
shipped this thing in 2017. Nothing else in the Mac lineup had anywhere close to this good I.O., this good performance, this good webcam, this good speaker quality. It was actually quite on par with the original HomePod sound quality. I ended up using this thing to play music quite a bit before the HomePod came out, because keep in mind, the HomePod hadn't even shipped yet when they started delivering this thing. So, for those who weren't aware, I basically bought the base model. The only thing I upgraded was the SSD. So this one is rocking two terabytes internally, but apart from that, everything else is the base spec. Eight cores, 32 gigs of RAM, the basic Radeon Pro Vega GPU, and it still handled everything I threw at it like a champ. You know, I was able to edit videos 4K at 60 multiple times a day and export all of these things for years on end, and I'm very proud to say that it has held up great. In fact, if I didn't need a laptop, I probably could have kept going editing all my videos off this for the foreseeable future. Obviously, the M1 Pro and M1 Max finally were something Apple was able to build that was actually faster than the iMac Pro, but it surprised me how long the iMac Pro specs were actually unbeatable. When I reviewed the Intel 16-inch MacBook Pro, it was pretty much on par with the iMac Pro, and then when the M1 chip came out, I was thinking this is the first generation of Apple Silicon, maybe this can finally beat my iMac Pro. And while it was better in some respects, in terms of just sheer export times, it was still a little bit slower, and it was impressive nonetheless that, you know, a fanless MacBook Air could actually come close to the performance of an iMac Pro and beat it in some regards. App launch times and real-time playback was better with the M1, but as soon as it came down to that export test, didn't matter if I was reviewing the fanless MacBook Air or the new 24-inch iMac with two fans on the inside, the M1 just could not beat out the iMac Pro's raw power. Even though it was using dated Intel processors, it was pretty hard to beat and I would say fairly future-proof, despite the fact that it's not upgradable or modular. This thing stood the test of time and all these years later is still honestly a really, really powerful machine that can still handle plenty of video editing performance and even cover the basic live streaming tasks that a lot of creators are using now. So I definitely consider this the greatest stopgap in history because if you guys will remember, there was a lot of talk about an updated all-in-one desktop and Apple making a refreshed version of the Mac Pro way back in 2017. And when this came out, there were a ton of people out there that were convinced this was a trap. This was a stopgap and it was just meant to hold over the pros until the Mac Pro launch. And that was supposed to be way better. And you know, in terms of modularity and upgradability, I guess it was. Certainly the Mac Pro ended up being much faster than the iMac Pro, but boy was it not better value. The cheapest Mac Pro, which shipped with a quarter of the storage this thing did, and arguably a worse graphics card, started at $6,000. And that did not come with a monitor, webcam, speakers, or anything. This thing was cheaper, offered arguably better specs and better I.O., because it still had four Thunderbolt ports, SD card slot, and the USB-A ports, but also included the whole 5K display, included the whole speaker system, and those are not things to shy away from when you consider how good they are for a package this price. And of course, all the rest of the Mac Pros were far more expensive. To actually get a good deal on one, you would probably have to end up spending well over $10,000 on that machine, which basically put it in a completely different category than the iMac Pro was sitting in. So maybe that's why I'm just such a big fan of the iMac Pro, was because it actually catered to a price point that I could obtain and that I thought was applicable. I think there were plenty of people out there that found great uses for the iMac Pro. Even Marquez detailed on the Waveform podcast how he was using an 18-core iMac Pro well into recent history as his best, like, most powerful mobile Mac. Like, he would take that around in a big travel case because packing around the Mac Pro everywhere wasn't as feasible, and even though it's a desktop, it's fairly slim and light, and you have your monitor and your speakers, you know, everything you need to edit your high-resolution, crispy videos on the go. So, certainly, that's not going to compete with the MacBook Pro now because Apple Silicon has finally surpassed the performance the iMac Pro had to offer, but I think we should give this iMac quite a bit of credit to consider how long it took Apple to actually beat it in terms of value. There was really not that many Macs available after 2017 that could compete with the I.O. and the performance here. Like, there was the 2019 27-inch iMac refresh, which was cheaper than the iMac Pro, but you were still limited to two Thunderbolt ports and the one fan for the cooling system. Yes, there were Intel processors that outperformed the Xeon chips later, but once you factor in the price of the SSD and the price of the graphics card to get it on par with this thing, it wasn't really that much cheaper and you still weren't getting as good a I.O. or, in my opinion, as great a design. I still dig that space gray look over silver every day of the week, and that cooling system is far more optimized 
surprised and far quieter than what the 27 inch IMAX had to offer even several years after this thing launched. So many people looked at it as a stopgap to hold over the pros until the Mac Pro is ready but in reality since Apple is transitioning to the ARM architecture and ditching Intel and my prediction is the modularity of the Mac Pro is not going to age too well because the Apple Silicon Mac Pro is probably not going to be anywhere near as upgradable or modular. In reality the $50,000 or $30,000 Mac Pro was the real trap. It sold people into thinking that they could buy a machine that was cheaper and upgradable because then they can you know swap out new components and improve it over time when in reality Apple was planning on ditching that whole approach to computers anyway and they were ditching Intel and x86 in favor of a more optimized more unified chip with the M1 and now of course we're hearing about the M1 Max being stitched together with four different chips and making a super powerful Mac Pro that will far outperform the current generation but probably not be very modular or upgradable whereas this thing launched three years before the first Apple Silicon Macs came and even those Macs could not compete with the power that the iMac Pro offered. So yes, I've now switched to the 16 inch MacBook Pro because the M1 Max and M1 Pro, yes, have finally beaten the performance of the iMac Pro, but still, let's just dwell on that for a second. It took four years before the value was actually starting to make sense to upgrade for me. Yes, I could have bought a faster Mac earlier, but it would have cost more money. Now, I spent the same amount of money on my MacBook Pro Pro as I did this machine and it's faster, it's mobile, it's got 120 hertz, it's got mini LED, it's got touch ID, and it's got four times as much storage, which uh, granted was pretty overkill but if you film as many videos as I do that extra storage is kind of nice but regardless a better machine in practically every way but at the end of the day the iMac Pro probably still beats my MacBook Pro in terms of IO there's just never been so much powerful ports mixed with legacy ports in one machine and the value here was astounding it aged incredibly well and there's really nothing wrong with it aside from it still runs on Intel and the webcam aperture being a little jittery during the live streams was somewhat annoying and of course people who want upgradability and modularity are going to be a bit frustrated with this because it's not really meant to be taken apart and parts aren't really meant to be swapped out thanks to Apple's security chips. Either way though I couldn't be happier with the purchase and in regards to best value Mac I've ever bought in my life this has got to be up there. Yes it was a lot of money paid close to six thousand dollars for this thing but it helped me create content for you guys for basically four years and I'm gonna miss using it every day. The only thing that I'm miss about this machine now that I've switched to my MacBook Pro is the size, but since it has a 60 hertz display, it's noticeably not as buttery smooth as I'm used to on my new MacBook Pro. So in my view, this was the perfected version of the iMac design. Yes, that includes the 2021 iMac. I still think this is the best all-in-one desktop any company has ever made, including Apple, but also including everybody else in the PC world. I've not seen a desktop all-in-one with specs this good that has aged this well, and I still expect to get software updates for years to come and if you're still using an iMac Pro out there and it gets by just fine I would say it really doesn't need to be upgraded if I wasn't a tech youtuber I probably wouldn't need to switch to the M1 Max but I probably wouldn't have bought this anyway so I want to keep upgrading to the latest and greatest tech and of course now that I'm traveling more I want to have a laptop that I can take with me but still this thing's a beast it ain't going nowhere we're hanging on to it but had to celebrate its fourth birthday and feel free to let me know what your favorite feature or favorite specs about the the iMac Pro was? What were your big issues with it that I don't know about? Why are you wrong? Tell me down below. What was wrong with the iMac Pro? Why do you hate it so much? This is your Apple Sheep here. I'll see you all in the next one.